Did you see how y'all doing? I'm Daryl Morrison. I'm going to be the pastor here at Valley Gate Church and excited to see your beautiful faces. Wasn't worship special this morning? I think God is doing something really cool with our worship and I'm excited about that. I want to give you a few quick kind of reminders uh, and then we're going to read our creed together. And uh, then we're going to dive into God's word. So uh, we've already mentioned it. Today is a health fair. We're excited to see all of your beautiful faces. And we want to make sure that after service, uh, first of all, we're going to go out and give them a moment to set up. But at 12 o'clock, we're going to meet over here um, in the multipurpose room for our health fair. And I truly believe this. I was talking about this earlier. You know, church is community. Community really means that we care for one another. And we have to care for one another enough to make sure that we're healthy and we're well. Uh, we have a guy in the first service who takes me to lunch and tells me that I'm fat and tells me I need to get in shape because he cares for me. He cares for me. And uh, sometimes telling the truth means that you got to receive the truth. And so guess who's going to be at the health fair today? I'm going to be at the health fair trying to see if any of those donuts have impacted me in any way that I don't want them to. So I want to encourage you before you leave, make sure that you go over there. We have blood screenings. There are going to be conversations about men and women's health. There are a lot of things that people set up today just for us as a church. And I want to make sure of this. If we're really going to win this valley together, if we're really going to be a people of worship together, we got to make sure that we're healthy and we're strong. And so this is our way of showing you that we love you and that we care for you. And we want to make sure that the years that God has in store for your life, uh, we want to experience every last one of them in the name of Jesus. You hear that? All right. You also saw that there was an announcement for our media team. And so anything that we do graphics wise, anything that we do as it relates to our videos, that's our team. And so throughout the summer, we're going to be highlighting different teams. And so if you're interested in learning more about our media team, they're going to be out on the patio. You don't have to have any experience. All you have to do is have a willing heart to learn. And uh, we'd love for you to just go out there and learn more about um, our media team. So it's going to be great. And we're always looking forward to adding people. Uh, our creed is, oh, d d how many of you all know what our theme for the year is? is together and so that's our theme we believe that this is our theme and so we've kind of incorporated this uh this kind of this creed and uh, i'm going to read the scripture that i believe kind of uh fits with what god has placed in my heart for us as a people together and then i want us to join together and we're going to read uh the words that come along afterwards our creed and so Paul is speaking to this church at Ephesus, and it's very clear that he is helping them understand, at least in this segment of Scripture, that there is something powerful that you can build as a people of God when you build it together. He uses the example of a temple, and he also uses the example of a dwelling place. That it, 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 The Scriptures seem to help us understand that God seems to show up where people are living together in unity. And we live in a very divisive world. Yeah. We do. And we use some of the most meaningless things to divide us. And God understands that the power of his people is when they are unified. And here's the beauty of it. Not on race, not on religion, not on politics, but based on Jesus. It's just the, it's the truth. And so the power that we have as an expression of God's people should be expressed in how we live our lives together. And so the scripture says it, and I believe hopefully it'll encourage you, and then we're going to read this together. And I want you to begin to understand that God is building something with us. He's doing something with us, and he's going to do it with us together. We are beginning to worship together. That's why you're experiencing something different in our worship. I believe our worship team is growing and getting better, but I believe that that worship team out there that includes y'all, we are starting to tap into Jesus together. I do. I also believe that God has called us to win the valley together that this church is going to be a church that impacts this valley, the metropolitan area. So that means where you live. All of you all don't live in Tempe. That means where you live. God is going to use you where you're at so that we can see people who don't know Christ come to know Christ. They're going to become disciples. They're going to become leaders, and they are going to change the world. If you really want to see the world change, it's going to start with the gospel. That's where the world is going to change. And so this is what God has called us to. So I'm emphatic about this. I'm passionate about this. And so please understand this scripture and then join it with me together as we read together. First of all, I'll read this. It says, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom, and I love this part, you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Now I'd like for us to read this together. We are a church fitted 
growing and built together to advance God's kingdom in the valley of the sun. Together we will love God, live for him, and lead people to Christ. This is our calling, so let's do it how? Together. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ that you've gathered us as your people to experience you in a supernatural way. God, our hearts are knitted, our minds are set to only receive what your infallible word can offer. And I pray that you'll begin to use this word to not only aid us, but to empower us to be vessels of your glory, to win the valley, and to see our worship, and to see this valley transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that we're called to do it, and we will do it together. It's in your name we pray, and everybody say amen. We're going to join together in Genesis chapter 16. To our guests, we want to say greetings. I'm excited to have you here. I know we've acknowledged you, but I want to personally acknowledge you and say thank you so much for being here. We are reading through the book of Genesis, and we're in Genesis chapter 16. We've taken a pit stop so that we can learn from some people in Genesis chapter 16. Last week, we learned a little bit about Sarai, and today we're going to learn about Abram, and then next week, we're going to learn about Hagar. And so I want my daughter to stand up and to read Genesis chapter 16 verses 1 through 6 now Sarai Abram's wife had not been able to bear children for him but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar so Sarai said to Abram the Lord has prevented me from having children go and sleep with my servant perhaps I can have children through her and Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal so Sarai Abram's wife took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexy time with Hagar, and she... (laughs) This is the New Living Faith translation. Um, (laughs) And she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, this is all your fault. I put my servant in your arms and now she's pregnant. She treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. Let's give her a hand clap, I think. Thank you, Faith. Sexy time, I like that, I like that. We're going to see if that works a little later. All right. So, um, man, she didn't mess my whole mind. <laughs> God, get your bearings there. I'll just get it right. Okay. This story is a beautiful story. And what I love about the Bible is once you begin to read the story in its totality, it begins to open up and unveil some things that we probably didn't know. A lot of Christians, what they like to do is they like to grab that specific text that seems to fit specifically towards them, and it matches everything that they're going through, and they align their lives based upon that one text. Maybe it's a verse or two. And yet what we start seeing is the unfolding and the unveiling of God's word begins to give you a panoramic view. It begins to help you see the horizon in which God has for you, that there is something about this story that includes each and every one of us. It's not just that we can grab something that seems good to us, but we have to actually take the journey with God through this text and to see ourselves in every step along the way. So when we get to Genesis chapter 16, you really can't give a a, a full picture of that unless you go back to Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, God began to give these instructions to a man named Abram. He said these seven things, these seven promises about Abram that I believe we can hold true to ourselves. He says, Abram, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make you a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you. And all the families of the world shall be blessed. That's why when I look at our church, all the families of the metropolitan area can be blessed through us. You got to hear me. See, I grab hold of this. But there was a problem. Because God was saying that I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless your family, that you are going to have a line, a lineage, you're going to have descendants that will come from you. But there was one problem, his wife Sarah was barren, she couldn't have children. So he has this promise, but he can't birth it. Abram will find himself kind of meandering through life and making some dumb decisions periodically, and we'll talk about that, making some dumb decisions like all Christians do. And yet he gets back on track and he continues to live for God. He has to go save his nephew Lot from this ungodliness in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes, saves him, and then God comes to him in Genesis chapter 15. And he comes to him in what they call a theophany. A theophany or Christophany, it means that there's a visualization of God or Jesus. He comes and he visits them. And he tells Abram this. 
He says, I am your shield and your very great reward, which means I am your defender and I am the one who will reward you. Abram seemed to have a problem with this because he says, God, if you're going to bless me and you're going to defend me, where are the children that you said you're going to bless me with? I've been living my life right for you and I still haven't experienced the promise that you said you had for me. I can feel it inside of me, but I can't see it birthed yet. God, what is wrong? What is going on? And so God confirms with him once again that you're not going to, your seed is not going to come from your servant. It's not going to come from somebody else. What I put in you is in you. And that's why I t tell each and every one of you, what God placed inside of you is inside of you. That means it's in me. See, the thing that you're waiting for, you can't ask somebody to do it for you. It's in you. The thing that you've been praying for, you can outsource it and think that somebody else is going to do it for you. It's in you. The thing that God wants to birth, that he can only birth, it can only be birthed through you because it's in you. You can't look to somebody else to try to produce something that's already inside of you. And he said, it's in you, Abram. It's in you. And it says that Abram believed the Lord. No baby, but belief. Promise still waning, but I believe you even more. I can't see it, but I believe it. But somewhere, as we learned last week, the message didn't seem to get to his wife, Sarah. Sarah, and we see in Genesis chapter 16, she then tells her husband, God has restricted me from having children. I don't have children but I have this maidservant. I'm going to outsource my promise to somebody who's not even God created to have it. And some of us are outsourcing our promises to people who should never even be a part of it. We've tricked ourselves into thinking that this person is going to be the one who's going to help produce the promise when that's not what God said. Perhaps, everybody say perhaps. You can't live your lives on perhaps is with God. Perhaps you can go and what faith calls sexy time, go lay with her as the Bible says. The Bible says lay. Okay, lay with her. I don't know what version that is. Okay. okay. I sh I, I, God, please don't let me say sexy time in this sermon no more. <laughs> Perhaps you go lay with her and we can produce children. We can produce children through her. That's what she said. I got on Sarah a lot last week. But now we have to look at Abram. Because, yeah, 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 look at now all of the ladies. Now all of the ladies in church, oh, yes, God, get, get Abram. He, you know it's his fault anyway. All right. But now it's time to look at Abram. Because I believe the issue here, as we've talked about, the issue is not faith. The issue is waiting. And I believe this thing, waiting, can really reveal some things about who we really are. I believe this thing called waiting can really show who God is to us. It's in the waiting where things seem to get difficult. So I'm going to ask this question. How many of you all have ever had problems with waiting? Problems with waiting. Okay. Uh, I have problems with waiting. Uh, you know I like to eat. Okay. So, so there are times in my life where I just have this idea of that perfect meal that, and this per my favorite restaurant that I want to go to. And I have in my mind just how great this food is going to be. I can taste the oxtails. <sighs> oh, with a little red beans and rice. The uh, cabbage. Daryl, get your mind, get your mind right, Daryl, get your mind. And sometimes I'm so excited about that meal to where I begin to think about that meal. And so what happens is, is in my haste, I choose to go to the restaurant without seeing how long the wait is. And so I have, this, I have this vision in my mind and I have this dream in my heart of what it's going to be like when I bite down into this beautiful food, this tastiness from heaven, this, this manna could, that could only come from heaven. And I get there and I have to ask them the question, how long is the wait? And then they say, yes, Mr. Morrison, uh, we can surely get you a seat in about 45 minutes. And there's a dilemma. There's the dilemma. Everything that I dreamed about and everything that I wanted now don't seem good enough if I got to wait for it. It seems so good when I didn't have to wait for it. 
And a lot of times, waiting will cause us to lose our spiritual disciplines. We'll turn our back on them because you're making me wait too long. I know the benefits if I wait, but I'm not willing to wait that long. That's one aspect of waiting. Uh, she's not here today, so she was in the first service, so I had to kind of clean this up a little bit. But how many of you all struggle with waiting on someone? <laughs> Who y'all think I'm talking about? Mm, I've been married for 31? 31 years. Yes, 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 31, 31 years. And, uh, and God has blessed me with this beautiful lady. And uh, she likes to take her own time. Yeah, see, women, you see, you thought I'd come back to get you. And I've been late for many things waiting on somebody else. I ain't going to tell you who it is. I've tried my best to sit in the car and read my Bible. I've tried my best to pray to God. I've tried my best to take out the garbage. I've tried everything I possibly could, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> and the one thing that's worse than waiting is waiting on someone else. But oh my goodness. The title of my text is Waiting on the Lord. How do you do when you have to wait on the Lord? I ain't heard no amens now. Oh, I ain't heard it from the males or the females. You hear me? All that preach and that amen and mm, all that went away, huh? It all goes away real fast. Because see, it's hard to wait on the Lord. If you choose to wait on the Lord, there must be a way in which you wait. I call this waiting well. When you wait, do you wait well? Mm. So let's look at Abram. Only two quick things, examples that he'll give us, but I believe these are very important. Verse 2 tells us that, and we'll go back to Genesis chapter 12. Now when we get to Genesis chapter 16, we see that it has been 10 years. God promised him 10 years ago that these things were going to happen, and at year 10, it still hadn't happened. So at year 10, Abram began to struggle waiting. And we know that he began to struggle waiting because he heeded the voice of Sarah. Remember what she said? Uh, boo, come here. I, I'm restricted from having children. I can't have children, but I do have my maidservant. Perhaps if you go in and lie with her, then we can have children. My first question to you all is, why in the world would Abram heed the voice of his wife. <sighs> I'm going to blame it on time. See, it took too long. Time had passed by. And the more time passes by, the easier we begin to listen to the opinions of others. The more time passes by, the easier we get talked into something that we know we shouldn't do. Time, we'll talk about this in a moment, it simply took too long. It absolutely took too long. And the longer it takes, the easier it is for us to alter God's plan. The other one that gets me was silence. Oh, man, when God tells you something, don't you need him to reaffirm it and confirm it in your heart again? God, did you really say that? You serious? You really have that for me? You serious, God? And then we want to see it. Like, just show me a little bit. What is it going to be like, God? And I believe that silence and the inability to see God move begin to impact Abram. There are moments in your life where God on purpose will go silent. Because he wants to see will you still follow him. He wants to see, do you still remember what he said? Or does he have to keep coming back to you over and over again saying, I said it, I'm going to do it. 
I know you're scared, but I'm going to do it. I know it seems too long, but I said I'm going to do it. And God sometimes will go silent on purpose. And when God goes silent, and it seems like we'll listen to the opinions of others, it's because we are being propositioned by, uh, by impatience. It, this was only an impatient moment. She was impatient. And her impatience began to now lure him into the conversation. See, he heeded the voice, not of his wife, but he heeded the voice of impatience. See, he gave in to the voice of someone else's brilliant idea, even though it didn't include God. See, Abram should have known this, though. Because when we look back at the text, Abram made some major faux pas, some major bad decisions earlier. Remember, God told him in Genesis chapter 12 that I'm going to bless you, I'm going to do all of that. Do you remember what happened right afterwards? It was a famine. God told him to go to Canaan, and the famine made him lose his way. He ended up going to Egypt. See, when you wait too long, or it seems like things aren't going right, it's easy for us to lose our way. So then as he makes it to Egypt, he gets to Egypt, and now he has to deal with fear. Because if you have to wait a little long, you're definitely going to be afraid. And he was afraid that they were going to kill him over his wife, Sarah. And you know what he did? The first thing, he lost his way. The now fear made him give something precious away. Oh, you don't hear me. How many of us have given something away that we knew we shouldn't have given away because of fear? That we're going to lose it. How many of us have chosen to do things that we knew we shouldn't have done only because of fear? He gave something precious away. And then impatience made him forget what God had to say. He forgot the word that God spoke. He ignored what God said because in the moment it seemed too difficult. And impatience will make you, impatience will quiet the voice of the Lord. So this is where Abram finds himself making that decision. This is where he jumps into something that he shouldn't. See, waiting well means you move and you act with God and you act with God in mind. Like you make decisions with God in mind. How many of us make decisions only with me in mind? Me, myself, and I. It's just, I'm sorry, it's sorry, just We make decisions with me in mind. And so we, I've learned in my life not to make decisions without God in mind because I made a decision early on at a young age without God in mind. I decided that it was best once my career was over in Washington, D.C. to move back to Arizona because it made sense. I'm from Arizona. My family's here. And so I chose to make a decision that seemed right in my own mind. And there's a way that seems right to a man that can ultimately lead to destruction. I made the decision because it all made sense. And a lot of us, that's what we make our decisions on is we make our decisions based upon sense. It seems right. It looks right. It feels right. So it has to be right. Perhaps. So when we live our lives of waiting well, you have to be willing to move with God and act with him in mind. Oh. Some of the things that we've chosen, we didn't have God in mind. That's not bad. It's just we just didn't have God in mind. But I want you from this point on that in everything you do and everything you choose, choose it with God in mind. Not you in mind, not your feelings, not your preferences, not your styles. Just choose it with God in mind. Number two, what Faith said. He went into Hagar and she conceived. So if point number one helped us understand that he gave in, that he was propositioned by impatience, point number two is saying he gave in to impatience. He gave in to it. He gave in. See, a concubine during that time was something that wasn't uncommon. 
And so concubines live with a man as if she were his husband, but she didn't have status as a wife. And if she had status as a wife, she had inferior rank. She was a secondary wife. And her purpose of being a concubine was to bear children for the barren wife. Later in 2 Chronicles chapter 11, we begin to see that people begin to take concubines just for sexual pleasure. Remember what I said? The progression of sin, just, it just keeps going, right? And so because it took too long and he was impatient, he chose the customs and the customary instead of waiting on God to do the supernatural. He conceded to this is the best that it's going to be. This must be the way that God is going to have to do it. He took a concubine who was a common solution for childness, uh, childlessness during that time instead of waiting on God to do the supernatural. He did what impatient people do. Impatience looks the same. Patience looks completely different. If you are patient, you look odd. If you're really patient, you're doing abnormal. If you're impatient, you're doing just like everybody else does. Can, can I use an example? Because we, we had to give two daughters away in over three weeks. Um, you know marriage has a purpose, a godly purpose. Do you know God's design? God is the designer of marriage. Remember we saw it in Genesis? Um, I ain't going to get no amens. At least I didn't get no amens to this. Uh, do you know that when I gave my daughters away, it was the full expectation that they had not had sex with their husband? The Bible says this. If you look upon a woman with lust in your eyes, you've already committed adultery in your heart. He said, if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, that you've already committed adultery in your heart. It then goes on and says that you treat a young woman as like a sister in the Lord. I've never looked at my sister saying, oh, girl, <laughs> ever, oh, ever in my life, ever. And you know what God is telling us, men? Until you marry her, she's your sister. I ain't got no amens, but I'm okay with it, okay? Then it goes on and it says, do not, light a f do, do not spark a fire that you can't contain. Then we get married and you come up and they say, who gives this woman to this man? Which means you didn't have her before, my brother. You didn't. She's not yours. I choose to give her to you. And then the beautiful one at the end of it. He says, you may what? Now. No, no. You may what? Now kiss your bride, which means until now, you shouldn't be kissing on her. I know, I know, see, I know we live in a culture that's so oh, you just everybody kiss. Everybody on the impatient side kiss. Oh, you gotta, you got you gotta try it out for everybody on the impatient side trying it out. But patience says those who wait on the Lord will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and they will not faint. You know why a lot of people give in? Because they're tired of waiting. At least y'all make me feel good because this is the way the first service sounds too. They just kind of like. <laughs> this, see, this Bible's amazing. This thing right here is amazing. And a lot of us want patient results without demonstrating patience. And so for him, he chose what was common and customary when he should have just waited on God. He chose what everybody else did and what everybody else says, and he forgot what God said. See, we were created to wait on God. You are actually created to wait on God. Let's look at some of the scriptures. 
Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be strong. And may your heart be stout. Wait on the Lord. So if I understand correctly, you're actually strengthened when you wait. You're secured when you wait. Psalms 33, 20. Our souls wait for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. So when we wait on the Lord, he defends and protects us. Psalms 41, 40 verse 1. I, everybody say I. I. <laughs> I waited patiently for the Lord. And he turned to me and he heard my cry. So this helps me understand. When it seems like you're waiting too long and it feels difficult, cry out to God. Don't cry on somebody else's shoulder. Cry out to God because he'll hear your cry. But what happens when we don't wait? <sighs> Best way I could use it, I'm a sports guy, and so some of you all may understand it, some of you all may not, but um, when I played sports, um, our coach would tell us on certain plays, you cannot, out, you cannot outrun your coverage. So what he meant is that there's a unit and we're all supposed to be in unison together and we're supposed to do this in one accord. We're supposed to be with one another. We're supposed to walk in step with one another. And if you outrun your coverage, it means that you choose to leave everybody else behind because you're running ahead. I don't care how fast you are. I don't care if you see the promise before everybody else does. I don't care if you see how good it looks. You're supposed to make sure you stay with your coverage. But when you outrun your coverage, then you run ahead of everyone else, trying to get there faster than anyone else. And generally what happens when you outrun your coverage, you have to deal with something that you ain't ready for. And it shakes you, it breaks you, it knocks you down. And the same place that you got knocked down is the same place where they're going to run a touchdown in your life. You know what the devil is doing? He is running touchdowns in our life because we're outrunning our coverage. Oh, I see her. Let me go get her. I'm out running my coverage. <laughs> I know everybody told me to wait, but let me go do it. Oh, I know I should not buy that house right now, but man, I, I know that the interest rate is only 12%. Let me go do it. <laughs> and we start out running our coverage. And every time we outrun our coverage, then we get exposed. I'm not talking about football. I'm talking about when we start out running the coverage of God. We leave God behind and we go running after things that we shouldn't. See, in patience, when we outrun our coverage, we're outrunning God. We're outrunning God. We're choosing to get there before God tells you to go. We didn't packed up and left before God even told you that he's ready for you to go. We didn't went for the dream, and it's going to turn into a nightmare. Because we've outrun our coverage. When we wait on God, then we wait for God. You didn't hear that? When we wait on on God, we wait for God. So he chose to outrun his coverage. Be careful not to give in when it seems like your time has run out. Be careful not to give in when it seems like your time has run out. Uh, those are my two points. But can I, can I just leave y'all with this as it relates to time? Uh, time is the thing that I believe tests your faith more than anything else. It's not temptation. Temptation is nothing more than a byproduct of time. Time is the thing that gets you into a lot of trouble. When it seems like it's taking too much time is when we begin to establish our own plans. Or some of us, we don't even worry about the time we establish our plan anyway. Here's the truth. Every one of us, when we make decisions, we always have a plan A. That plan is normally devised, established, and really enacted without God. I ain't heard no amens, but I want you to think about it. Everyone has a timeline. See, there are certain things that you want to do, and you want to do it by this time. God didn't set that time. If you notice something about God in the Bible, if we learn this, what God is very good at, and I love this about God, God is very good at establishing his plan. And his plan generally comes with some form of instructions. Abram, 
I want you to get up. I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your kindred. And I want you to leave your family. And I want you to go to the place that I'm telling you to. He gave them specific instructions. But he didn't give them all the details. But he did give them direction. Go this way. But you know what he left out? Time. He told them I'm going to make you great, but he never told them when. So a lot of us, what we do is we hold on to God's plan, but then we devise our own timeline. I should be married by this age. I should have kids by this age. I definitely should have a house by this age. Right? We, we set our own timelines. And God is not involved in your timeline. Okay? That's plan A. So I'm going to sell the house. I'm going to get the new job. The baby will come. I'll get the new job offer. I'll get that big check. All of those are based upon our timeline. Our faith is more ruled by when instead of who. Because we never question if God can do it. We get upset when he doesn't do it when we want him to do it. Okay? So what do you do when it doesn't happen when you thought it should happen? Because that's where Abram is. What do you do when time has run out? What do you do when your time has expired? A lot of us, what we do is we move to plan B. And plan B is just an inverted version of plan A. But I want to encourage you with something. Get rid of your plan A, throw away your plan B, and commit to your plan G. You know what plan G is. It's what Drake say, God's plan, God's plan. I'm sorry. God's plan. Everybody say God's plan. When we start trusting in God's plan, then we know that God will do it, and we trust that he will do it when he wants to do it. When we start believing that, God, I know what you have for me, and all I have to do is trust you until you give it to me, then we will do it. And so we have to start trusting in God's plan. This is not down here, but I want you to remember this, and please remember this one. When waiting on the Lord, remember this, God's plans won't change, but yours will. Your, if you are truly a Christian and you are following God, your plans will have to change because his won't. He changes them. And the only reason has to change them because you made up the plans anyway. And so he has to adjust them to get them right back in line. So really what have I really said is that there, there are moments and times in our life where we're going to have to wait on the Lord. We just won't wait. We got to wait on, Lord, on the Lord. And we have to choose patience over impatience. We got to make sure that we don't listen to the voice of another and forget what God had to say. So how do we wait well? As I summarize this, waiting well means when you feel like it's taking too long and you can't hear or you can't see God. Three things you need to do. Number one, pray. Prayer is something that we all must do. You gotta commune with God. And hear me on this. When you pray to God, make sure that you're not just offering up prayers of supplication which means that you're asking in humility for what you want. But make sure that when you pray, it's also a consultation where God can tell you what he wants. When we pray, you want to pray to hear God say it, not just God do it. You want to pray and you want to hear God say, no, because God's no. It's better than any of the world's yeses. Wait, it is yours, but just not now. Or go. When we pray, when you consult God, like when you really seek God, as the Bible says, seek first, 
the kingdom of God. Don't seek your plan. Pray and ask God to reveal his plan. Then you need to read your Bible. If there's another thing I want to see God do with us together as a church, no matter where you're at in your understanding, is start cracking up this Bible. Open up this Bible. Let's just read it. Read it. Because remember, when it seemed like it got difficult, God's words began to become faint. And whenever God's words, his audible words, seem to become faint, it's because you probably haven't opened up his written word. Can I tell you something? What God has for you, it's not new. You, you, you don't have to wait to hear something new. He's, he, he's not going to do something so supernaturally new with you. Everything that God said he's going to do for, through, and to his people are in this book. And I know this little book right here is so archaic for some of you all. I know that right now it just doesn't seem to meet with the culture that you live in. I know that 2,000 years ago that was for those people in Israel. I know that. And I know right now that you, you, you find more clarity and understanding on TikTok. I know that. But this right here is the infallible word of God. This right here is a word that is sharper than a double-edged sword. This word will pierce you down to the joint and to the marrow. As my mother say, until you see the white meat. This word penetrates everything and every situation you'll go through. This word speaks about sin and idolatry and choosing the will of man over the will of God. This word still speaks to everything that we go through right now in our lives. And unfortunately, as much as we want to talk about Abram, I think we've allowed time to dull us from hearing God's voice. And now we listen to the voice of the world. You know I can't stand it when we start sounding like the world. Instead of sounding and looking like the word. I wish all of us would speak New King James Version. <laughs> I wish we would sound like our Bible reads. I wish we would live the what our Bible says. I wish we would hold on to what this word tells us to instead of telling me what your little friend told you. Then you have to trust. You have to trust his plan. You have to trust his timing. And you got to trust his word. God's plan is greater than your plan. His ways and his timing is always outside of your timing. True faith that I've learned always demonstrates itself on the backdrop of the impossible. It's once you run out of time is when God shows up. It's once when everything that you planned seems to have been destroyed and now you let God build it. The things that I've seen stand well are the things where people had to wait on God. And it's okay to wait if it's going to strengthen you. It's okay to wait if he'll defend you. It's okay to wait if he's going to renew you. Because waiting is not a curse. Waiting is a blessing. Then you got to trust in his word. You got to believe this thing even when other people think you're crazy. You got to trust what he says in this word and apply it to every aspect of your life. This thing has got to become real. It's got to be the manner in which you eat, the life in which you live, and the power in which you gain your strength. This word. And you won't do it if you don't trust it. So he says, I wait on the Lord. Summarize it, Isaiah 40. Verse 31, then we're done. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Your greatest strength comes in your ability to wait on your great God. The fulfillment of God's promises for your life on the other side of you just waiting for him to do it. 
And I know it seems like you can't see it. But I want you to wait for it. I know it seems like you might have a better alternative. But I want you to wait for God's plan. And as you do, it's my prayer that you'll experience the goodness of God here in the land of the living. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Man, I thank you. I thank you for the things that I've had to wait for, even when I didn't want to wait. I thank you for the many things that seems like I should have given up, but you wouldn't let me. I thank you that your word is true. And so I'm going to trust you. I pray that each and every one of us today would choose to wait on you. And while we wait, make us better. And while we wait, make us bigger. And while we wait, make us stronger so that we can be prepared for all that you have for us. There may be somebody here today that one of the things that you've neglected to wait on, you've been too impatient and you've chosen your own way, is just truly, you just haven't been willing to wait long enough on God. So you've sought out other things. You've chosen your own way and you've directed your own course. But today, I believe there's somebody here who wants to say, I need you, Jesus, in my life. And I want to choose you. And I want to choose from this point on to wait on you. That means I'm going to trust you. I'm going to rely upon you. And I'm going to choose to live according to your plan. If there's anybody who will recognize that I've been living my own way, but I don't want to do that anymore. I want to choose him. With your eyes closed and your head bowed, just raise your hand so I can see and I want to pray for you. Amen. I see those hands. You can put them down. I want to pray for each and every one of you. And I want each and every one of us to say this prayer together. So repeat after me. Dear Lord, I need you. I've not waited and I've not trusted in you. But today, I relinquish all of who I am to your, your authority. Save me. Cleanse me. Heal me and forgive me. I turn away from what's kept me from following after you. And I choose you and you alone. Amen. I just want to pray this over you. Father, we thank you for each person that made that decision. And I pray from this point on that they wait on you. I pray that they would wait well and that they would experience all the things that you've already promised them. It's in them. It's for them. And all they need to do is to wait for you. We honor you, Jesus, in your precious, magnificent, most holy, powerful name. I pray. Amen. God bless you. Jerome is going to come and close us out.